Welcome back. My name is Harjit, and we're here with Plenary Session 2, South Asia as Others See It. Uh, we have once again a stellar list of speakers that joins me on the stage, and also a very popular and brilliant moderator. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the panel brought in collectively, starting first with Mr. Richard Armitage, former Deputy Secretary of State from the United States of America. Join me in giving him a big more welcome, please. To begin that, I just forgotten that uh, I need to hand it over to the MC for the hour. Uh, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Tommy Co. Please, thank you. Thank you, and sorry, sir. Uh, I, I had to stop him because he was trying to steal my job. <laughs> um, it, it is often said that the session immediately after lunch is the most challenging because you are happy from lunch and you are liable to fall asleep. So my good friend Gopi has taken that into account and he has uh, organized a star-studded cast for this session. So I'm very privileged to chair this session, South Asia as others see it. Let me introduce the, the first of the four very distinguished speakers. Richard Armitage and I have been friends for over 30 years. And uh, my admiration and respect for him has increased with the years, which is kind of unusual for, for many friendships. <laughs> um, but let me just tell you a little bit about this outstanding American leader. He went to the Naval Academy in Annapolis and um, had three combat sessions in Vietnam during the war. He then served in the American government in many senior positions. When I was in Washington, he was the Assistant Secretary for Defense, of Defense for International Cooperation. He's held other jobs in Pentagon. Um, when Colin Powell, when General Colin Powell was appointed Secretary of State, Colin personally pressured him to be the Deputy Secretary of the State Department. And as many of you know, he did a super job in that position. <clears throat> he's um, he's um, a really good friend of Asia and of um, Southeast Asia. And I'm very pleased that he will be our first speaker this afternoon. Rich, before I call on you to speak, if I may just say that we will be interested in hearing from you your comments on the significant South Asian diasporas in the United States and America and the role that they play in the American body politic and how this has influenced or not influenced America's management of her relations with South Asia. We would also welcome your views on US relations with the countries of that region. Um, please join me in welcoming Richard Armitage. Thank you, Tommy. Well, good afternoon. As Tommy indicated, we've got the unenviable task of trying to keep you awake after lunch, but we'll do our best. Dr. Han, Chairman Makihara, Dr. Tan Chung, thank you uh, for uh, participating along with me today. I appreciate it. You'll be uh, a good source of advice and uh, guidance. I'll listen very carefully to what you have to say. And Ambassador Ko, thank you for 30 years of advice and friendship. I'd like to start, if I may, by expressing condolences to the people of India, particularly the city of Mumbai, for this recent terrorist attack. And to assure our Indian friends that we pray for those who are departed, we pray for those who are wounded and their families, and we pray for justice in this matter. I do want to start with talking about India because for an American, we consider the development of the relationship with India a great success story, but it's not a success story that belongs just to George Bush and the stamp of approval put on it by Barack Obama. Five successive American presidents from the time of Ronald Reagan have worked very hard to try to develop this relationship, and it was slow. From an American point of view, we were very nervous about the relationship that India had with the Soviet Union. And from India's point of view, if I may be so bold, 
uh, there was a, a necessary time to develop confidence to uh, be able to engage in a relationship with the United States without uh, doing too much violence to non-aligned uh, activities, et cetera. But we're where we need to be. And for the, the specter of the two largest democracies in the world, multi-religious, multi-racial, um, uh, uh, multicultural, to have this type of relationship seems natural in retrospect. You know, India was a great source of guidance to the United States. They had already developed a look east policy, realizing that the strategic center of gravity of the world had shifted to Asia, and India was certainly going to be part of it, and we've paid close attention to India's views on this, and as Secretary Gates made clear at our Shangri-La dialogue here, or the Shangri-La dialogue uh, a couple of months ago, uh, we're fully engaged in the life of Asia and intend to continue that way. Speaking just a short bit about the diaspora, for Americans, the uh, Indian American community is a source of great inspiration. They're very high tech, extraordinarily entrepreneurial, quite political. Now, why would I say that? Well, in the United States political society, there are a couple of political action committees that are very noteworthy. One is the American Israeli Public Affairs Commission, a committee. And I think the second is the Indian Caucus. A woman by the name of Hillary Clinton just happened to be the leader of the Indian Caucus in the Senate. So uh, whether you're talking about business life, whether you're talking about political life, Indian Americans are a very big part of the United States. I think I'll shift over to Pakistan, if I may, and just say that notwithstanding the vision of Dr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah in 1947, the governance of Pakistan, I think, is almost beyond the ken of man. It's not a country. It was, in 1947, in my view, it was five different countries, now four different countries since uh, East uh, Pakistan has become Bangladesh, with different customs, cultures, language, and some antipathies between and among them. So it's a difficult governance problem. And let's be clear about something else. Whether you had democratically elected governments, or martial law governments in Pakistan, the people of Pakistan never got the governance they deserved. At best, they were ignored, and at worst, uh, they were uh, put upon and corrupt, and it was suffered at the hands of corrupt government officials. And this has been the one constant, unfortunately, for the Pakistani people. And the reason I raise this is that we have 187 million citizens in Pakistan. I think the median age is about 21. They're going to be around a long time. They need to get better governance. And a growth rate, by the way, of 2% annum in the GDP, given the high birth rate in Pakistan, is a death sentence for Pakistan. So the stakes are very dear. The United States' relationship with Pakistan, although we had an embassy uh, in Islamabad since uh, 1947, really went into high gear after the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. And we worked cheek by jowl with our Pakistani uh, friends to evict the Soviets from Afghanistan. Now, we shared the same aim, the eviction of the Soviets, but we had two different objectives, the Pakistanis and the United States, for us the eviction of the Soviet Union from Afghanistan would show that they're not invulnerable and would give them cause to worry in their soft and vulnerable Muslim Central Asian republics, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and Uzbekistan. This was our aim. Zia haq the president of Pakistan, had another aim beyond eviction of the Soviets, and that was to spread his views of Islam uh, further west and also to develop strategic depth against India. This went on until we achieved our aim. And then the United States almost immediately, or within a year, evoked sanctions against Pakistan because of their nuclear development. And for 10 years, we had no relationship with the Pakistani military, none, because of the sanctions. And a great irony was, the very day of 9-11, that morning, before the planes hit the Twin Towers, the State Department delegation was on their way to Capitol Hill to begin to unravel the sanctions regime against Pakistan because we had come to the view that we had to take the hyphen 
out of the word India, Pakistan, Indo-Pak. We had to try to deal with India in and of itself and Pakistan in and of itself. But when 9-11 took place, it gave us the opportunity to approach Capitol Hill, remove all the sanctions, and go forward with a more normal relationship with Pakistan. And we did from 2001 to around 2005. During my time as Deputy Secretary, I could find no real evidence that the ISI in Pakistan was involved beyond simple liaison with the Taliban in Afghanistan. But after 2005, I think, I can't prove it to you, but I think the following happened. I think, the, well, I know the Taliban started to dig up their weapons and started to pursue uh, military action uh, at a quite higher pace. But I think the ISI came to the conclusion that maybe the United States was a little short of breath. And if we were short of breath and didn't have the willpower to stick it out in Afghanistan, then they were going to return to their old policy of support for the Pashtun Taliban for two reasons. Again, strategic depth against India, and two, they wanted to have a seat at the Taliban table in Kandahar in the south and the east. And of course, there are many questions now raised in the minds of many in America about what the real direction of Pakistan is. And I'll tell you a personal anecdote that'll, that'll show you why many Americans have questions about what's going on in Pakistan. 15 months ago, I visited Afghanistan and Pakistan. And after I left Afghanistan, I went to Islamabad and I called up an old colleague who'd been my counterpart 20 years previously. He had been chief of staff of the army and uh, also ISI director at another stage in his life. And after he got over his surprise, and, at having me call, we agreed to meet for coffee. I would go to his house, and he said, do you know where I live? And I said, yes, sir, you live in the same house you lived in 20 years ago. He said, well, that's correct. I'll welcome you. So I went to his house, and uh, he welcomed me kindly, although he's been very virulent in his writings against the West and against the United States, and somewhat, in my view, extremist in his views, but he was quite kind, as he would be, uh, given the, the custom of hospitality that they have. And he sat me down, we had a cup of tea, and he asked, could a third person join the meeting? And I, of course, said, yes, sir, it's your house. And he opened the door from another room, and a fellow entered, who was about six feet four inches tall, ramrod straight, wearing Pashtun garb and a pukul, which is the Afghan-type hat, and a beard to the middle of his chest. I knew immediately who this man was. I knew him under a different name. He was now going under the name Colonel Imam. And if you Google Colonel Imam, you'll see that this gentleman is the father of the Taliban. He was the chief Mujahideen trainer during the war against the Soviets, but he's also known as the father of the Taliban. And he proceeded to tell me he had just been in Marja, which is a small area in Afghanistan where we were having about to embark upon a military operation with our Marines. And he said, uh, here's what the Taliban are going to do, and uh, uh, you can, they'll run away when they feel like it, and you won't be able to get anyone who can govern that place well. And went on and on for about an hour. Well, the content of his conversation is not as important as the following fact. This fellow was going back and forth to Afghanistan. He was previously the chief trainer for the Mujahideen, and he was the father of the Taliban. My friends, or my former counterpart's house, was directly across the street from the chief of staff of the Pakistan Army's house. It is not plausible that people didn't know about this type of liaison. And these kind of anecdotes are what raises questions.